That, uh, that last line of that, that bumper says that we are running with giants. I want to explain what that means. The Bible talks about uh, the life that you're living right now as if you are standing on a racetrack and you are running. And uh, it, we, we actually see this in Hebrews 12 Verse 1, this is the theme verse for this entire summer series that we're going through, Running with Giants. It says this, Therefore, since we are surrounded, picture this for a moment. Picture that you are on the track running a race, and when you look up into the crowd, you are surrounded by who? It says by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith. Let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up, and let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. So we have this picture. You are on the track of life, and you are running, hopefully running, this race. And in the stands, you are surrounded by a a huge crowd of witnesses. Who are they? Who are these people that are cheering you on? And the way that the Bible kind of, the way I understand this, this passage of Scripture, these are the giants of the faith that have already passed on. They are no longer running the race. They were running the race, and now, if you will, they have retired into eternity. And they are now sitting uh, surrounding you in the stands, cheering you on in your own race. How awesome is that? That we have giants of the faith that we can look at, that we can go into Scripture and we can say, hey, what is it that you, should, that you would tell me if I asked you to coach me? As we pull giants out of the stand for the next seven weeks, we're going to take one giant a week. Uh, by giant, I don't mean literal like giants, right? I'm talking about someone whose faith was so large that we call them a giant of the faith. In fact, You just go back one chapter in Hebrews chapter 11 and you get a chapter that we call the Hall of Faith. These are the the, the men and women who have just a tremendous story of faithfulness to God. And these people are no longer living. But if we were to take them and say, hey, I am, I'm running this race, and I need you to stand. I need you to be in my, in my corner cheering me on. I need you to be yelling at me, telling me what it is that I ought to be doing. I need you to be coaching me from the sidelines. I need you to run with me. What is it that these giants would say to us? That's what we're going to be looking at over these next seven weeks. And today, specifically, we're going to look at a giant by the name of Joseph. Now, there are a lot of Josephs in the Bible. Uh, We're going to specifically look at uh, the Joseph that takes up most of the story of Genesis. Uh, Genesis is broken up into two parts. So if you go all the way back to the very first book in the New Testament, Genesis chapters uh, 1 through 11 is basically the story about how God created uh, the earth and kind of got everything started. Uh, That's chapters 1 through 11. And then chapters 12 through through the end of Genesis, is ultimately the story of Abraham and his family. It's the story of Abraham. Uh, Abraham had a son named Isaac. You remember Isaac? And Isaac got married uh, to Rebekah, and they had two sons, uh, Jacob and Esau. Remember Jacob and Esau were both vying for their father's blessing before he died, and Jacob was able to, through deceit, get his father's blessing. So you have Abraham and then Isaac and then Jacob. And then Jacob, uh, his name was changed in the Bible. Sometimes you see him called Jacob. Sometimes you see him called Israel. So Jacob and Israel are the same person. And when you hear in the Bible about the 12 tribes of Israel, it's really the 12 sons of Jacob. Jacob had 12 sons, and each of them had their own family line. Each of them, uh, their families went on, and you can read about them in Scripture in a lot of places. But one of Israel's, one of Jacob's sons, his 11th son, was Joseph. So Joseph, uh, for the sake of a family tree, is the great-grandson of Abraham. And Abraham, as we know, had many sons. 
This is, this is one of his family line. Now, here's the crazy thing about uh, Jacob and his sons. You see, he had uh, fathers. If you want some free advice here on Father's Day today, don't ever do this. Don't ever choose a favorite son or daughter and then tell them. <laughs> but uh, Jacob didn't do this. He had uh, 12 sons. At the, the beginning of the story, there were only 11 And Joseph was the youngest of his sons. And Joseph, at this point, at the beginning of the story, was his favorite son. So much so that every other son knew. It wasn't a secret. In fact, he got a special gift from his dad because he was so special. Many of you know about this, right? He got a coat of many colors, a technicolor dream coat, right? So he's got this coat, and imagine Joseph walking around in this nice coat. His brothers don't have a coat on like this at all, and he's walking around. Not only is everybody aware that he is his dad's favorite, but now he's wearing it on him. He's like, yeah, clearly I'm dad's favorite. And the Bible shows us that his brothers hated him for it. It doesn't take a lot of imagination to imagine why his brothers didn't like him very much. Imagine if your family had favorites and they were vocal about it and you weren't it. Uh, You probably would have some animosity towards your sibling that was, right? And that's what happened here. So Joseph is dad's favorite, and we can read about his story in Genesis chapter 37 all the way through the end of Genesis chapter 50. So if you want, we don't have time today to read the entire story of Joseph. I have to give you a Cliff's Note version today. But the story of Joseph is a phenomenal story. It's a story of ups and downs. It's a story of twists and turns. It's an incredible story. Um, But for the sake of today, I have to give you just the highlights uh, and tell you what it is that I think Joseph would say to you if you asked him to coach you from the stands. If you asked him to get out of the stands and come on the field and run alongside you, what is it that Joseph would say to you? Hey, coach, what do you got for me? What do you want me to do? And here's what Joseph would say. He would say this, don't quit. If you want a story of incredible endurance, if you want to know what what endurance looks like, this is it. This is, Joseph's life is an incredible story of endurance. And I, I want to give you a, this, this, this concept of don't quit, some of you right now, you are in a phase of your life right now where you are ready to, to throw in the towel. Maybe you're ready to, to quit on a dream that you have. Maybe you feel like God was calling you to something and things just aren't working out the way you expected, so you're ready to, to throw, it, throw in the towel. You're ready to quit. Maybe you're ready to quit on your faith. Maybe you, oh, you know, you've, you've been trying, you've been being faithful to Jesus and you've been studying Him and trying to, and for whatever reason, it just seems like you've been abandoned and you're ready to just quit on this, this journey of faith. Maybe, and I know this is a really serious note, maybe there's someone in this room right now that you're, th- you're considering quitting on life. That you've been wrestling with suicidal thoughts and you feel like, you know what, I just don't see why I would keep living this life anymore. If that's you this morning, I, I want you to, to hear very clearly, not just from me and not just from Joseph, but from God himself through his word. Listen, brother, sister, do not quit. God has a really good plan for your life. And Joseph is going to help us to explore why we ought to keep going even when we feel like quitting. When I was in high school, I played a sport uh, that doesn't exist on the East Coast. You guys have a sport over here called lacrosse. In California, we didn't have lacrosse. We had another sport called water polo, and it was a sport I loved to play. I was on the varsity water polo team, and in order to be on the varsity water polo team, you also had to be, by order of the coach, 
on the swim team. In other words, you needed to be off season. You needed to be practicing. You needed to be in the water. You needed to be preparing for whatever God, uh, you know, whatever uh, God is, is going to build you up and strengthen you so that when it comes time to water polo season, you have the strength to keep going. This is kind of the way, right? You got you to get ready for, for water polo. And on the, the swim team, uh, there was a, an event that you would randomly get assigned. Uh, you wouldn't randomly get assigned, but you never really knew what event you were going to be swimming until the day of the meet. And you'd go up and you'd look, and there was this one event called the, the 500 free. And the 500 free, what it was, was it was swimming the whole length of the pool 20 times. It was an endurance race. It wasn't a speed race. You didn't jump in there and swim as fast as you can for, for 20 laps. You just, you, you went and you just kept going. And it was the hardest race to swim because you wanted, after about four laps, if you're like me, I was like, I'm done. I don't want to keep swimming this thing. But the problem is, is that you can't, right? You have to keep going until you finished 20 lengths of the pool. And the, the cool part about the 500 free is that you had a team of people at the other end of the pool that were kind of, uh, they were your cheerleaders, right? They would be cheering you on, and they had this thing that they could put in the water that you could see it as you were swimming towards the other end of the pool. You could watch, and you could see what was on this sign. And what was on this sign, you know what would have been really cool to see on the sign? You got it. Keep going. Don't quit. Like, those would have been really encouraging words. Uh, but they weren't allowed to put those words in there. Uh, the only thing they could put in the water, a message to the swimmer, is how many laps are left. <laughs> so you jump in the water, right? And you're, Normally they wouldn't do it right away because it's, it's super discouraging to get down there and see, wait, 19? That's, wait, that's not encouraging at all, right? But eventually you, you notice that as you're swimming, that number is getting smaller and smaller and you keep going and you have that endurance uh, you, you need to have that endurance to not quit and to keep going until you finally see that number one, one lap, you know, one length to go. You're almost there. Finish strong. And you notice we always find that energy on that last little bit, right? We can find the, the energy to go strong. And Joseph would be saying this to you, listen, this life, it is not a sprint. We need to learn how to run with endurance, Check this out in uh, the beginning of Joseph's story, Genesis 37, verses 5 to 7. It says, one night, Joseph had a dream. And when he told his brothers about it, they hated him, listen to this, more than ever. So they already hated him. Okay, He was already hated by his brothers. They now hated him more than ever. It says, listen to this dream. He said, we were out in the field tying up bundles of grain. Suddenly my bundle stood up and your bundles all gathered around and bowed low before mine. So imagine Joseph, he's walking, he's already got his nifty little coat on, he's dad's favorite, he has this dream and he's like, hey, brothers who already hate me, check this out, I got this dream I want to share with you. The dream is this, that I will be standing and all of you will be bowing to me. They did not like this dream at all. They, they hated him even more for even sharing the dream. Listen, if God ever gives you a dream like this about your siblings, keep it to yourself. <laughs> they were mad. They were so mad, they sold Joseph into slavery, we find out. And eventually we end at this verse towards the end of his story. Genesis 42, verse 6, is the fulfillment of this dream Listen, this is 23 years later. It says, when they arrived, they bowed before him, their faces to the ground. Here's, here's the whole, we have the beginning. Joseph has a dream that all his brothers are going to bow before him. And then there's this period of 23 years that Joseph has to run this race. And then we get to the very end where his brothers, the dream is fulfilled, his brothers are bowing before him, begging him for, for forgiveness and food and water and all that good stuff. You see, 23 years, I think, here's what that says to me. If anyone has a right to jump on the track with me and tell me not to quit, it's Joseph. 23 years of endurance. He has the right to tell me whatever he wants to tell me. 
to encourage me. And there's a lot of different ways to tell someone not to quit. A lot of different reasons you would tell someone not to quit. The first reason I think Joseph would say not to quit, he would say this. Listen, don't quit when you have a lousy start. Don't quit when you have a lousy start. Here's the problem. When you find out, when Joseph had this dream, when he learned that there was this uh, this time in the future where his brothers were going to bow before him, any time really in your own life that you feel like God is calling you to something new or you have this new idea or this new calling, this new vision for what God's wanting to do in your life, that can be a really exciting time in your life, can't it? It's probably one of the most exciting phases of the whole dreaming process, the moment the idea comes to you. If you've ever had a business idea, you know this to be true. You get this idea, and you're thinking, oh my goodness, this is amazing, and you, you start, right, you're, you're, you're planning, and you come up with a name, and you start telling people, and like, this is awesome. That's part of the, the start of the dream. It's one of the best parts. I remember once I was uh, in a, the bathtub that my kids normally use taking a shower, and in that shower we had these special crayons that you can write on the sides of the shower. They were bath crayons, and the idea was as soon as you're done, you can wash them off and all the, it rinses away. And I was in the, in the shower where all of my ideas come to me, and I'm sitting there thinking, and all of a sudden I get this business idea. And I'm thinking, oh, oh, this is good. I got to write this down. So I grab bath crayons and I, and we're talking like beautiful mind here, okay? I am writing all over. I have covered every circuit surface of the inside of the shower stall with ideas and numbers and graphs and there's lines connecting things and there's math problems. And this thing is just, I step back and I'm like, this, this is awesome. I'm so excited about it. Uh, that when I got out of the shower, I didn't want it to get washed away because I needed to somehow transfer this to a more presentable uh, document for other people to see. Um, So I I left it up there a little too long, and to this day, we've never been able to scrub a lot of that blue crayon off of that wall. Uh, So somebody else now has a, uh, we sold the house, somebody else has my great idea. Um, But listen, that, that moment at the beginning when God has given you an idea, God has given you a dream, something to run towards, It's such an exciting part of that process. But then, imagine Joseph. He sees this dream. How exciting uh, it must have been to to know that God had this this plan and this purpose for his life. And then what happens? Genesis 37, verse 28. It says, So when the Ishmaelites, who were Medianite traders, came by, Joseph's brothers pulled him out of the cistern, Remember, they originally put him in the cistern, and they were going to let him die there. They decided we can actually make some money here, so they pulled him out of the cistern, and they sold him for 20 pieces of silver. Basically, they sold him into slavery, and the traders took him off to Egypt. This was not a great start to Joseph's dream. I got this dream. I'm going to be in a position of, of greatness and my brothers are going to uh, be bowing before me. And isn't that awesome? And he finds himself just shortly thereafter uh, a slave and his brothers have completely abandoned him. That is not what you call a good start. That is not the way when you have a dream you want things to, to kick off. And yet that's how they happened for Joseph. You know, Thomas Edison, they say, uh, when he had already gone through 9,000 tries when he was trying to invent the light bulb before he actually finished he was already at 9,000 attempts and somebody came up to him and they said hey don't you feel like a failure at some point like 9,000 attempts and here's what he said he says I uh why should I feel like a failure and why should I ever give up I now know definitely over 9,000 ways an electric light bulb will never work You see, it's that perspective that we understand that when we have a lousy start, when things don't go the way we expect them to right off the get-go, that if we can shift our perspective and understand that God knows what he's doing, it's going to help us to run with perseverance. Proverbs 24, 16 says it this way, The godly may trip seven times, but they will get up again. But one disaster is enough to overthrow the wicked. 
So here's the question. Those of you who follow Christ, you are godly. When you find yourself with a lousy start, when you find yourself tripped up and on the ground, don't throw in the towel. Get up. Keep running. That's what Joseph would be whispering to you right now. Here's another thing that Joseph would say about quitting. He would say, don't quit when you have little support. Don't quit when you feel like there's no one around you supporting you. When you feel like your own family has abandoned you, Joseph's saying, oh wait, you think you have a story about your family abandoning you? Listen to my story. When you think, oh man, if you just heard what my boss did to me, Joseph would say, oh, whoa, whoa, hold on. You want a story about what your boss has done to you? Listen to mine. When you think your friends have abandoned you, uh, Joseph was like, let me tell you about the time my, my closest friends left me in prison for two years and forgot about me. When you think you've had little support, no doubt Joseph can one-up you. Mark 6, 4, Jesus has even experienced this in his own life. He says, a prophet is honored everywhere except his own hometown and among his relatives and his own family. Have you ever noticed that sometimes the people who know you the best, uh, it's hardest to get support from them? They know all your, they know, they know all your little stories from when you were a kid. They know your weaknesses and your failures. And like the people who know you the best, sometimes they're the ones who don't take you seriously. And Jesus experienced that in his own life. So Joseph, just a, a, again, Cliff's note version, he gets sold into slavery and he becomes the, the, the servant of a man named Potiphar. And Potiphar was, uh, was basically, his position was he was the chief of the Pharaoh's bodyguards. All right, so the Pharaoh had bodyguards and Potiphar was in charge of all those guys. And, and Joseph was, became the slave in Potiphar's house. And the Bible says that, that Jesus, that God blessed uh, Joseph's work so much and everything he touched was blessed. Potiphar noticed this about Joseph, so he decided to, to, to raise Joseph to a level of authority in his house. And he said, Joseph is now in charge of my entire household. He's in charge of everything that comes and goes around here. He's in charge of my finances. Joseph has is, is, been raised just from this lowly servant into this position of authority within Potiphar's house. And then what happens is uh, Potiphar has a wife who, who is attracted to Joseph. So Potiphar's wife asks Joseph to come to bed with her, and Joseph says, no, I, I honor and respect my, my Lord and my master Potiphar. I'm not going to do that. But she doesn't like that answer, so she basically grabs his cloak and tries to pull him into bed with her, and he runs to escape this. And now she's sitting there holding Joseph's shirt in her hand, and uh, when the, the guards come in, she makes up a story, and she says, you're not going to believe what just happened. Joseph was in here, and he tried to rape me. And Potiphar hears this story, and here's what it says in Genesis 39, 19 to 20. It says, Potiphar was furious when he heard his wife's story about how Joseph had treated her. So he took Joseph and threw him into the prison where the king's prisoners were held, and there he remained. So he's falsely accused and thrown into to prison. Now, here's the deal about Potiphar. We know that he very much cared for Joseph. We know that he trusted Joseph. And the crazy thing here, too, is what would you do if you were the chief of the Pharaoh's uh, bodyguards and you found out someone was trying to do some funny business with your wife? What do you think Potiphar could have done in that moment? He could have killed him. For what I would have done, Right? Wait, what did you try to do? Like, in that moment, Potiphar could have easily had Joseph killed. And the fact that he didn't, the fact that Potiphar, instead of having Joseph killed, had him taken and put in prison, I think, I'm just, uh, this is conjecture, but I think that Potiphar knew that his wife's story wasn't true. I think Potiphar knew that Joseph was an honorable man, 
but he had to do something about his wife's accusation. So Joseph, in that moment, was betrayed by his boss. Talk about little support. And then we see this get even worse. While Joseph was in prison, he made friends. He made friends with Uh, the people in prison, and again, everything Joseph did was blessed by God to the point where the the, the head of the prison saw that Joseph was the man. So he put Joseph in charge of the prison. Now get this, everything Joseph does, God is blessing. So now Joseph is in charge of all the prisoners, he's in charge of the prison, and two of the prisoners have a dream, and Joseph is able to interpret them properly and tell them exactly what their dream means. And one of them is good news, one of them is bad news, but at the end of the day, this guy, he, one of the dreams he interpreted was of the, the Pharaoh's cupbearer. And that cupbearer was released from prison, just like the dream said, that he would be released from prison to go and continue to serve the Pharaoh. And Joseph says, listen, when you go back and you see the Pharaoh, would you, would you do me a favor and remember me? Would you tell Pharaoh about what, what I did and that I didn't do that other thing? And would you would you speak on my behalf? And the cupbearer, one of his closest friends from prison, gets out and forgets all about Joseph. And Joseph spends another whole two years in prison because his friend forgot about him. So here's the deal. If you've ever felt like you've had little support from your family, little support from a boss, little support from coworkers, little support from from your friends. Joseph wants to remind you, me too, don't quit. Keep running. You see, the truth is that you don't have little support. When you feel like there's no one cheering you on from the stands, no matter what, God's word is very clear that Jesus himself is running alongside you. And it doesn't matter if your friends or your family or your boss or whoever, you don't feel like you have support from them. Romans 8.38 says, I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. Not abandonment by your family, not abandonment by your boss, not abandonment by your friends. It doesn't matter what anybody tries to do with you or to you, nothing will ever separate you from God's love. So Joseph is whispering to you right now, listen, don't quit when you have little support because you got God by your side. Number three, Joseph would say, don't quit when you experience hurdles. The whole idea of running around a track to me, uh, I don't like to run, so that already doesn't really sound exciting to me. I'm not a runner. Uh, My body shape probably gives it away. Um, I've never been a runner, but the idea of going out on a track to run, uh, fine. If I got to, all right, put me on a track, I'll run around a few times. But then this whole idea of a hurdle, that just sounds cruel, doesn't it? Like, wait, now I got to run and jump over things? And some of us in our life right now, listen, you are experiencing a hurdle right now in your life. Some of you, you're feeling like, you know, Matt, I get over one hurdle, and as soon as I'm on the other side of that hurdle, I'm looking at another hurdle. And I feel like I'm just jumping over hurdles, and my life is just hurdle after hurdle after hurdle. Some of you feel like you got one big hurdle, and it's like this tall, and you have no idea how you're going to get past it. Some of you are, for some reason, you're like, right now, Matt, I, I don't have really any hurdles in my life. This season of my life is hurdle-free. Well, let me, let me tell you something. Uh, that's not going to be true forever, right? There are going to be moments in your life where you are going to experience hurdles. And if you want me, if that sounds really negative and you want me to be more positive, let me be positive for a moment. I am positive that you're going to experience hurdles, (laughs) okay? All of us are going to have hurdles in our lives that we have to go over. And Joseph's life was full of hurdles, let me, let me show you for a moment on the screen uh, some of the, the things that happened in Joseph's life. This is the Cliff Notes version 
of Joseph's life. Number one, he was misunderstood by his family. And then he was sold into slavery to Potiphar. And then he was living in a strange country far from home. And then he was given favor in Potiphar's house. And then he was falsely accused by Potiphar's wife. And then he was thrown into prison. And then he was put in charge of all the prisoners. He was forgotten by the chief cupbearer. He remained in prison two years longer. And then he interpreted Pharaoh's dream. And then finally his dream was fulfilled and he became second in command of all of Egypt. I want to do an experiment with you here. This is a, um, uh, I, I need you to participate. This is a participation event. Let's go through this list again. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to tell me uh, when we put something up on the screen, you tell me if that thing is something that, if it happened in your life, would make you want to give up or go on. Now, I know right now all of you are thinking this is a trick. I think Matt wants us to say go on no matter what. Uh, this isn't a trick. Uh, here's what I want you to do. If it's something bad that would normally make you want to give up, I want you to just yell, give up. If it's something good that would give you encouragement to go on, I want you to yell, go on, all right? I'm not looking for the Sunday school answer here. Don't just shout out Jesus. All right, here we go. All right, number one, he was misunderstood by his family. Give up, right? That's a give up. Uh, he was sold into slavery to Potiphar. He was living in a strange country far from home. He was given favor in Potiphar's house. Go on. Yeah, that's a good one, right? Finally, uh, he was falsely accused by Potiphar's wife. He was thrown into prison. He was put in charge of all of the prisoners. Go on. That's, yeah, that's a good thing. Uh, he was forgotten by the chief, the chief cupbearer. He remained in prison two years longer. And then he interpreted Pharaoh's dream. Go on. And he became second in command of all of Egypt. Go on. If you really pay attention to this list, you'll see that he had twice as many give up moments than he had go on moments. So here's, here's the encouragement to you. You're likely in your life, probably, going to have twice as many hurdle moments then you have hurdle-free moments. If your life feels like it's mostly jumping over hurdles, Joseph says, man, I know what that feels like. Don't quit when you experience them. Here's a fourth thing and, and final thing. Joseph would say, don't quit when you're exhausted. I believe that when you are doing anything that requires endurance, when you are swimming a 500 free, when you are running you know, cross country, when you, are, when you are living a godly Christian life, all of these things require tremendous endurance. These are not sprints. This is not something you just do real quick and get done and you're like, Whew, I'm glad that's over, right? It's something that you have to go and you have to go and even when you feel like you can't go on anymore, even when you're tired, even when your muscles are saying, Matt, we're done. As some of you in this room right now, you're saying, Matt, it's easy for you, it's easy for Joseph to say, uh, don't give up, but you don't know what I'm going through at this moment. You do not know how tired I am. I can't even feel my legs anymore. I want to remind you that Joseph didn't see the fulfillment of his dream for 23 years. The amazing thing, too, in the story of Joseph, Genesis 37 through the end of Genesis, not one time, listen, we know Joseph was a sinner. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But for whatever reason, not one single time is there ever a recorded instance of Joseph sinning. In this whole story. Not once do we see him get angry or raise his voice or get mad or shout or punch a wall. We don't see Joseph uh, in, in the middle of exhaustion ever do anything that I would do in the middle of exhaustion. When I feel like giving up, man, those are the moments where I, I probably act the most not like Christ. And Joseph would say, listen, brother and sister, when you are tired, when you are exhausted, don't quit. 
Psalm 73, 26 says, says it this way. It says, my health, my health may fail and my spirit may grow weak, but God remains the strength of my heart. He is mine forever. See, we have an incredible strength within us through the Holy Spirit. So let me give us a so what. It's easy for, uh, for Joseph to say something like, hey, church, don't quit. It's really easy to, to step up and to just say, hey, hey, don't quit. But if you're like me, I would want the coach, I would want Joseph to tell me, uh, listen, I get, Joseph, that you didn't quit. I get that you went through a lot of things and you had to jump over a lot of hurdles and you had a lousy start. I get that you didn't have anyone supporting you or cheering you on. I get that all these things were true for you, uh, but I need to know more than just don't quit. I need you to tell me how to do life without quitting. How do I not quit? Because everything inside of me says quit, quit, quit. How do I go through life without quitting? And one of the crazy things we find is this shift in perspective that needs to happen. So if I ask Joseph, how do I not quit? Joseph will say this. What's the secret? I think he would say, shift your perspective. I want you to write this down if you can. Focus on what is happening in you, not what is happening to you. Is something happening in your life right now? Are you experiencing a hurdle? Are you experiencing exhaustion? Are you wanting to quit because of a lousy start or lousy friends? Listen, instead of focusing on that, instead of focusing on what's happening to you, I want you to focus on what's happening in you. What is God doing in your life as you're learning to run this race with endurance? That's what the real takeaway is. You see, Joseph, at the very end of his story, Genesis chapter 50, the very last chapter in Genesis, his brothers now know who he is. They've already come and they've bowed before him. We see the fulfillment of his dream and his brothers are begging for forgiveness. Now that their dad uh, has passed away, now that Israel is no longer living, they're afraid that Joseph is going to kill them because of what they did to him. And Joseph says this, listen to this perspective. He says, you intended to harm me, but God intended it all for good. He brought me to this position so I could save the lives of my people. What he said is, I went through 23 years of confusion and frustration and exhaustion, and I kept running. And why? So that I could be here right now to save your lives. There's a, a verse um, in Romans 8, 28. I want to leave you with this before we pray. It says, and we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose for them. Everything God is doing in your life right now, all the things that are making you want to throw in the towel and quit, the things that are making you want to give up on your dream, that are making you want to give up on your faith, and maybe wanting you, making you want to give up on life. Listen, God works all things together for the good of those who love him. Let's pray. God, we, we love you. and We thank you that uh, this life you have for us is, is good. God, we know that when we keep our eyes on the finish line, when we keep our eyes focused on the prize, uh, that you are going to give us the strength and the endurance we need to get through well that you're going to surround us by these crowds of giants of the faith to whisper truth into our lives and to tell us to keep going. And we thank you for the story of Joseph and him to, saying to, to me and to us, don't quit, keep going. I know it's hard, but keep running with endurance. Throw off anything that's slowing you down and run this race in such a way as to win. Dad, thank you, we love you, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.